from John chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone believes in him and will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. And thank you to our students for uh, sharing the gospel with us. Uh, for uh, for those who want to go to Sunday school, your Sunday school teacher will meet you in the back of the room, and you know the drill. And uh, and again, thank you for for those who shared the word. Well, so here we are. We're in week two of Advent. Hooray! <laughs> We're that much closer to uh, to a destination that is yet to come, um, but it might not be the one that's just two and a half weeks away. Um, we are in this season of waiting, and, uh, and that's what Advent is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be a, a season where we pump the brakes and, and we wait. And so last week, we started off by, uh, by kind of in our devotional series and in the, in the sermon, we were thinking about that, uh, that prophetic proclamation, just that the idea that, um, that there was a promise in the Old Testament that we see that Jesus was and is coming. And so we can look back and see how, how God made it very, very clear that this promise was there for us and we got to see it fulfilled in the incarnation of Christ and, uh, and we get to be excited about that. And this week, is a, we're calling it expectant jubilation. It's about the promise that he will and is doing something, that we get to look forward to what's going on. And, uh, um, and that's where we realize how God is touching our lives in the right here and the right now. But in that, that title, expectant jubilation, I'm, I'm hung up on the word expectant because we all have expectations, right? Do we not? I, uh, I read one place that, uh, and you break down any argument between any two people, and you can imagine where most of those arguments happen. Um, any argument between any two people, it's going to be about unmet expectations. You can, you can come up with a topic area of any kind, but at the end of the day, it's all about unmet expectations. And we, we all have expectations. We have expectations about, about what Jesus is going to do in this world and what Jesus is going to do in our lives. Um, we all have them, whether we like to admit it or not. And some of those expectations can be boiled down to a simple list. They, we have these expectations that, uh, that there'll be prosperity, stability, wealth, and growth. Now, depending upon your perspective, as I say those four things, um, you might be cringing just a little bit. Is that, is that really what I want? Maybe it is, doggone it. Well, the good news is that those are things all promised in Scripture for us. Where the problem comes, I think, for us is, is well, it's really about our frame of reference. You see, the world um, has its own frame for what those four things are supposed to look like and also a timeline that goes with it. The world measures things in days, weeks, months, years. Maybe lately it's been more like seconds, minutes, and hours. Um, but we're always in a hurry. But in God's economy, things work differently. He measures things in, in generations and seasons and millennia and eons. These are very, very different timeline than the one we would prefer God to be on, don't, isn't it? And, uh, and I'm reminded of, uh, of Second Peter. He, he recorded this in chapter 3. He said, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. God is working on a totally different sense of scale and time, and we have to wrap our minds around that. 
because we're all in a hurry. We're impatient. We want things right now. And I'll probably say it every week as we're in this season, I'm an Amazon Prime member because I want my stuff in two days or less. Because that's what the world tells us we're supposed to be wanting. Now, last week we talked about Simeon. And, uh, and Simeon kind of understood this. Uh, he knew to look past the surface and, and the expedience that we all desire. He, he was not looking for somebody who was immediately significant, powerful, and wealthy. Instead, he was able to recognize the Christ in a small, weak, impoverished child coming to the temple to be dedicated. Simeon knew to look with patience at what God was doing. But we recognize that expedience is somehow wired into us. And there's a price that goes with expedience. When we rush things, there are inevitably unintended and unexpected consequences. When we do things our way, we might get immediate gratification, but there ends up being long-term liabilities that we end up discovering later on. Now, the world demands expedience. And I'm afraid that as we take time to reflect on many of the issues that trouble our nation, our lives, our culture, we might reluctantly have to come to terms with the fact that most of those problems are a result of our previous impatience. When we attempt to control that which should be entrusted to God, we find ourselves plunging into darkness. Now, plunging is something that sounds like it happens fast, and it does from God's perspective. You know, we, we were talking just a minute ago, days, months, years. Well, that's what, what God is looking at us in terms of generations, and we can see how things have shifted so radically around us. But God, God promises in the darkness that there will be light. The first words ever recorded of God speaking are Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And what does he say? Let there be light. That is the very, very first words God says and a promise for us all that there is light to be had. And Jesus comes as part of God's perfect plan to bring us out of the darkness, a darkness that, quite frankly, we chose and created. Jesus is the light. And the choice to follow the light of Christ means that we get to be obedient to God's plan. <laughs> and that means we have to resist the temptation for expedience. We get to wait on the Lord, whether we like it or not, but it's going to be worth it. The choice to follow the light of Christ, in fact, will have more short-term liabilities than they will benefits. But here's the thing. God's promise is that the reward for following the light is infinitely greater than anything this world can offer us now or ever. And so it's going to be worth the wait. And we wait. This morning, we were finding ourselves in John chapter 3. And again, I just want to thank the students that were, uh, that were a part of putting that together. Um, we were right in the middle of a scene with Nicodemus. So if you go to the beginning of John chapter 3, um, Nicodemus, in fact, I'm just going to read that to you. It's not going to be up on the screen. Um, so just so that people in the back know not to look. Um, <laughs> there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Now, the, the thing about Nicodemus is um, you got to like the guy, but there's also something else going on. Um, there's a mention of the time of day. It was after dark that, uh, that Nicodemus comes to see Jesus. Now, I encourage you all to, to read the Gospel of John sometime and pay attention to John's references to time of day. Because time of day, he's not really actually interested in you knowing what time you should record on your watch, what was going on. He's interested in that distinction between light and dark. And it's always a foreshadow of what's going on. Nicodemus is a good guy. You'll want to like him, but he shows up in the darkness because he currently is in the darkness. He's confused. 
And, uh, um, and Nicodemus seems to recognize that Jesus is more than he can comprehend, which is why he's there. He knows that there's something about this guy that's different, and he wants to know. He wants to understand. But the problem with poor Nicodemus is he's also trapped by his station. He's, uh, he's trapped within what I will call the dark Jewish structure. And I don't mean that to be offensive to the Jewish community. I mean it by saying that, that they're not walking in the light in that moment. Nicodemus is a man of significance, of power, and of wealth. Everything that the economy of this world says he should have. But somehow, Nicodemus understands that he's in the darkness right now. And he doesn't, he, he knows that there's something going on and that he, in fact, might be wrong, which is why he finds himself speaking to Jesus. Now, if you, if you start in at chapter 3, Jesus has an exchange with him where they, they start talking about rebirth. And uh, um, Jesus says to, to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And, uh, and Nicodemus is like, how is that possible? How am I supposed to come out of my mom's womb again? And uh, <clears throat> I've always wondered about that passage. Um, Jesus, Jesus challenges him. He says, you're a theologian, um, a teacher of the Jews, and, and you don't understand this? My wonder about this is, is that was it that, that Nicodemus didn't quite capture the metaphor, that it was too deep for him somehow? Or was it that he completely caught the metaphor, completely understood what Jesus was saying? Because what Jesus was saying is, listen, you have to blow up everything you've ever thought you knew in order to embrace this, which is me, something new in this world. Holy moly. <laughs> Nicodemus is thinking to himself, I want to push back on this somehow because what is he asking me to do? How is this possible is what he's saying. That's, that's, well, at least that's what I wonder. You can decide for yourself. But then Jesus goes on into this story, just a quick reference to an Old Testament event about serpents being lifted up on poles an Old Testament story that's going to be revived here. Um, and it's about people, the people of Israel, um, actually being bit by snakes and they're dying. And, uh, and then Moses is given some instructions on what to do about that. And it includes putting a bronze snake on a pole and lifting it up. And, uh, and that everybody was supposed to look at that. We're going to dive deep into that in just a second. Um, Jesus goes on to say that just like that, so too the Son of Man is to be lifted up. And then he goes on to the most famous passage in the New Testament. You all know it. You have some version of it memorized already. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. Whoever might believe in him will have life. Now, I came across an interesting uh, commentary about this. Most of us, if you have a red letter Bible, verses, all these verses are in red, this whole, this whole section. But a whole lot of commentators actually don't think that verses 16 and 17 should be in red. And the reason for this is that, is that uh, they, they think that, that Jesus said something and then John jumps in to offer some explanation. And it's really, really hard to tell when John's writing um, where his explanations end and begin and Jesus's words are. Now, it doesn't change the fact that these words are there for a reason and we should latch on to them. Um, but what it does change is if John is, is offering an explanation in verse 16 and 17, then what's he offering the explanation to? It's verses 14 and 15, this stuff about a snake on a pole we need to suddenly pay more attention to that because maybe that's what, what, what he's wanting us to dig into. And so that's what I'd like to do for a moment with us. I'd like to jump to Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse 4. And that's where this scene that Jesus is referring to is happening. And, uh, and I'm going to share it with you really quick. It says this, When the people of Israel set out from Mount Or, taking the road, um, um, yeah, taking the road to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Eden. But the people grew impatient. Oh no, there's that word again. The people grew impatient with the long journey and they began to speak against God and Moses. 
Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told them, or told him rather, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. And all who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by the snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Okay, what? <laughs> um, so, so the basic explanation is that we got caught with impatience, right? The people of Israel get impatient with what's going on. They don't like what they have in front of them, and, uh, and they start complaining about it. And God, who actually knows pretty well how to send plagues, says, fine, it's time for you all to get a plague. And, uh, and they very quickly have the desired result, which is repentance. And they, and they come back and they say, we're really sorry. What do we need to do to bring this to an end? And then we get to this bit where God gives instructions to Moses about this bronze snake on a pole. Now, I was curious about what a traditional Jewish interpretation of this text looked like. Um, what, what would the Jews say? We have Jesus offering um, it within the context of the gospel, but what if you were sitting in a Jewish synagogue and they came uh, upon this text? What would they say? And, and there are a number of uh, possibilities that they kind of boil down to, to two categories that, that fit really close together. One was, was this, that, that was a symbol that the serpent is, is something that's on the ground and that's what you fear and you look to the ground, but by lifting it up, it forces you to look up to the heavens to see God. And so it was really kind of a metaphor in obedience that stop looking at your problems here, keep your eyes on God. That was kind of what they were going for. A lot of the other interpreters just try to keep it a lot more simple. They just say, when God says do something that doesn't need to make sense, just do it. <laughs> and that's pretty much the two, the two camps that I could find looking at, looking at Jewish literature. Now, just to, just to kind of run with this for a second, um, what happened with this pole? There's a, there's a history that goes with it. The pole and the bronze snake actually ended up in the temple. So in the tent of meeting, and then ultimately in the temple built by, by Solomon. And uh, um, we find out that over time, the people of Israel found themselves spending a lot of time actually worshiping the snake on the pole. Um, in, in 2 Kings 18, King Hezekiah actually has that pole and snake destroyed because he realizes that this has turned into idol worship. They're not looking past it to heaven. They're just looking at it for healing. And, uh, and we end up seeing that the, um, in the Greek gods, um, it's, uh, um, I'm going to mispronounce this again, Asclepus um, is, the, is the god of medicine, and, uh, and he, too, is seen with a pole wrapped in snakes. We don't know um, which one came first. It's believed that it was the, uh, um, the, the Jewish tradition. But there it is. That's the, uh, that's the logo for the American Medical Association, a pole with snakes wrapped around it. Um, yeah, you can decide what you want to do with that in your own minds. Um, but <laughs> so... so Jesus makes reference to all of this right now, and, and, uh, and at some level, it sounds kind of simple, um, what Jesus says, and I'm going to recap those words. He says, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. It sounds simple, just like the Israelites had to, had to look up at the snake for healing. All we need to do is look to Jesus for salvation, right? Now, John, when writing this, would know where the story is going. Nicodemus, when hearing it, would not, which is to say lifted up. When somebody says he's lifted up, that's usually 
an implication of lifted up to a throne of some kind, a place of honor. We know that Jesus is going to be lifted up on a pole himself. A very, very different image than what Nicodemus may have been hearing in that moment. So we have a foreshadowing of the cross. But let me offer another thought here that puts emphasis on thinking of John 3, 16 and 17 and projecting that back onto to this imagery of the pole and the, and the snake. The snake, the serpent, was an instrument of suffering that was a plague for the people of Israel. And the instruction there by God was to take a symbol of this instrument of suffering and lift that suffering to God, and God will heal you from that suffering, that single suffering. Imagine this. If we have individual serpents in our lives, we'll call them, I don't know, what's a good word for it? Sin. (laughs) And we lift those individually up to God and put our trust in him He restores us from those, or rather, he heals us from those individual sins when we put our trust in him. Jesus is the instrument of life. When we look up to him and model ourselves in light of his sacrifice for us, he doesn't just restore us from individual events. He seeks to restore our entire identity as children of God. Think about that for a minute. We can lift up our individual problems one at a time under complete control, um, deciding which one we want to lift up, when we want to lift it up. Or we can turn our eyes to Jesus Christ and surrender our lives to him and then watch him completely transform every aspect of our lives. It doesn't happen overnight, by the way, but it does happen. Which brings me back to poor Nicodemus. Nicodemus had been a lifelong follower of God, and now he finds himself in the presence of Jesus, faced with a choice, being invited to follow the light of Christ. The Pharisees, they had packaged God. That's really what they had done, right? Um, God, the God of Israel, was now under their control. It had taken centuries for them to do this, um, and it probably was never intentional, but what they had managed to do is reduce God, the creator of the universe, into something for which they had complete control over. God, with a capital G, was now being mortally managed by the institution of the temple, And we have, in effect, God with a little g because he's under human control. Now, Nicodemus was a sincere student of Scripture. He believed and studied his Bible carefully, but he was raised by an education system that was ultimately worshiping itself, if you can imagine it that way. And as it's worshiping itself, it's calling it God, but it's really with a little g. And now, Nicodemus is in a room with God incarnate, face to face with God, and he's thinking, I have a problem. I think I've been doing this right the whole time, but I'm looking, I think, at God, and he's telling me I got it wrong. And Nicodemus had to struggle with this. Nicodemus leaves in the dark after this. We do know that Nicodemus shows back up. Um, He's there at Jesus' crucifixion. Legend is that he was uh, secretly a disciple. I kind of wonder how you can be a secret disciple of Jesus. But, um, but, But that was the conflict. And here's the thing. We are in the exact same boat as Nicodemus. We have all been bit by the serpent. And we know that serpent because he shows up in chapter 3 of Genesis. We have all been plagued by that death. Each and every one of us here faces death simply because we crave control. That was what that temptation was all about. You want control of stuff? Just disobey God and you can be in control. 
And that's what we all struggle with. Even when we find ourselves in circumstances where we have no control at all, we still crave it. We'll complain about it. We want control. Offered an audience with the source of light and life, just like Nicodemus, we're going to hesitate. Why? Because we like being in control. Obedience to Jesus means that we have to surrender all control to him. And we don't like that. Like Nicodemus, we've been trained to maintain control. In the darkness, we think we know what we're doing. But when we stop and reflect, we end up discovering all of those unintended consequences that sneak up over years, months, decades, generations later. It all happens. And when we allow the light in, we end up realizing how not in control we really are. So what does that mean for us in this, the second Sunday in Advent? The real value of Advent is that it is a season where we wait. We stop. We suspend our tendency for expedience, and we get to realize the effects that our previous expedience has had on us. We wait for Jesus, and as we do, we begin to realize that there is a choice for us to make a choice that we may have never noticed because we've been too busy going. See, the choice is simple when a, when a guy like me stands up here and paints this picture, right? Who's going to ever say, oh, let's not choose the light? But the reality is, it is a hard choice. It is a very, very hard choice because we crave what we know, and what we know is darkness. Everyone here is holding something back and trying to keep control of it. Every single one of us. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a habit that we know God has called us to get rid of, but we like it, and so we hold on to it. Maybe it's a commitment that we know God is calling us to dive into, but we like holding that hostage, and so we hold on to it. Maybe, maybe... Maybe it's a gift that we're supposed to give someone. There's a reason that forgiveness has give in it, right? Maybe we're holding somebody ransom by not forgiving them. In any case, we're trying to control something that needs to be surrendered to God. And while we hold on to whatever it is, it is actively killing us. So that brings us then back to John 3, 16 and 17. Because here's the good news. As we're holding on to whatever that thing is that's killing us, we have a God who loves the world so much that he gave us his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Amen, amen, and amen. The hope is there for us. This statement is the truth about the nature of God. It is the hope that will save our lives. It may not be expedient, but it is effective. Everyone who looked at that snake on a pole for Moses had 100% cure rate. Every one of us here who lifts our eyes to Jesus Christ and accepts him as our Lord and Savior, 100% will be saved. That's the promise. A choice to follow the light of Christ, in fact, is more likely to have short-term liabilities than uh, than long-term, or rather, (laughs) short-term liabilities than benefits. But God's promise is, is that the reward that's following this, when we follow the light, the the reward is infinitely greater than anything this world can ever offer us. It is worth the wait. And so, obediently, we wait. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you for the gift of your son in our lives. You are the one that initiates all contact. You are the one that comes to us. In John's gospel, just before that, that bit about the snake and the pole, it says that no one's ever gone to heaven and then come back, but God has come to us from heaven. He is the one who initiates contact. His love breaks the silence of darkness in our world. Darkness does not need to reign in our lives anymore. And yet, Lord, we need your help to choose the light. Help us, Lord, to let go of our desires to be in control. Pry open our fingers and bring us into your presence. Stir in our hearts a desire to worship you so that in everything we say and everything we do, it brings you glory. Let our lives be worship, worship of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.